so thank you all for joining us uh, this is a Ontario chapter event for TechSoup Connect and I am Sandra Amer and I'm your local TechSoup Connect host here uh, for the Ontario area I'm not sure where we have everyone from if you're all from the Ontario area or if so some of you are from somewhere else we do have a global network for Tech for Good meetups all across the world. Um, if you like, feel free to uh, tell us a bit about yourself in the chat and maybe where you're from, say hello. Uh, we are a nonprofit that help other nonprofits to get, implement, and use tech effectively. So hopefully that's why you're here today. And a little bit about our community values. We welcome everyone and we always put our community first. So we're all here to support each other and to grow stronger nonprofits. And we use technology as uh, one of our tools to be able to do that. And I love to have people participate. Um, and I know it's a little bit difficult when we're online, um, but uh, I'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback on these events, if there's anything specific you'd like me to try to find, or if you have something you would like to uh, present on or part participate with, uh, please let me know. And obviously we love to treat each other with kindness and respect. And uh, we have Boren Zaza here, or Boren from, you're the Communication Director at Orchestras Canada. Welcome. Uh, nice to meet you. And I see we have Catherine here as well, and I'm sure a few other people will trickle in as we continue. Um, so at TechSoup Connect, we need your help. Uh, we're always looking for people to produce events or uh, take care of marketing. Um, we don't really take too many notes in, in this kind of webinar environment, but uh, anyone who's interested in helping plan an event, like I mentioned, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to hear about that. Uh, let me just get my notes open here. There we go. Okay, um, so a little bit more about TechSoup for any of the, you who may be new to TechSoup. Uh, we help connect, uh, TechSoup helps connect you with donated and discounted products and there's a whole bunch of uh, items that they uh, can help you source and, and get at a discounted rate including software, hardware, projectors, hotspots, uh, and also refurbished hardware. Uh, lots of great things for you there. And these are just a few of the examples of the uh, some of the vendors and service providers that TechSoup works with that you can get uh, discounted items from. And uh, a great comparison. So if you are with TechSoup and a nonprofit, uh, this is a comparison if you were a nonprofit with 10 staff members as to the savings you can actually see by uh, using TechSoup for, uh, in this case, this kind of suite that they've put together as an example. Uh, and as you can see, that's a significant uh, cost savings for a yearly uh, subscription fee. If you need additional tech help, uh, there is a form on TechSoup.org where you can ask questions and look for answers for anything related to nonprofit tech that can uh, help you build a better organization. So feel free to check that out at forums.techsoup.org. And as you probably, I'm not sure if you came across this event through Meetup or through our new event platform, but all of our events are listed on events.techsoup.org. And uh, this event here is being hosted by myself for the Ontario chapter. Uh, but there are several other chapters out there as well that are also doing other virtual events that you may want to go and check out. And moving along, um, so this event today is brought to you by me at All About Systems, and I'll talk a bit more about what I do a little bit later. Um, and our agenda for today, so you're all here today to see my presentation on capturing information in the cloud. So we're going to be looking at Google Forms and how you can create better forms and capture data so that you can use it. Hi, Eli. <laughs> and at the end of our 
presentation, we're going to have a one minute community update. So if you're still on our call at the end, uh, you will have some time to let us know what new and interesting things you're up to, because we all know you're doing some amazing things out there. So I'd love to hear about it. And I'm sure others would love to hear about it if you are willing to share. So moving along, we're um, oh, before we get to today's event, um, our next upcoming event is currently scheduled for October, although I have a feeling we'll probably plug in a few more events between now and then. Um, but this is what we have on the calendar right now. Uh, I'm presenting this one as well to uh, help you learn how to create a virtual onboarding program using free tools. Uh, it's something that I've been working with uh, lately, so I thought it would be great to share with you guys as well. Um, and I think we've already seen the slide, so I'm going to switch over to our presentation. Okay. Can you guys still see my slide? Uh, my slides. You should see. Uh, uh, it's loading. You should see Google Forms uh, slide now, capturing data in the cloud. Hopefully, that's good. Hi, Eli. All right. So we're going to talk about Google Forms and capturing data in the cloud. So let me, I'll turn off my camera so you can see the slides better, I think. Um, and I will try to keep it, oh, did I lose my slides? Where did I go? We've got some fabulous pool background. Yeah, <laughs> that's my my winter vacation spot. <laughs> All right, uh, hopefully you see it now. Uh, we're on our objective. Okay. Uh, one second. I have to switch. There we go. Okay. All these boxes I need to uh, rearrange. One second. <laughs> yes, you're my cheerleader, Eli. I love that. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be learning some tips and tricks on how to use Google Forms effectively to cr collect uh, responses and data and information in the cloud. And many of the tips that you're going to learn here today could be applied to other uh, forms and collection tools as well. Uh, but we will be doing a uh, specific look at Google Forms and how to actually use it. So. Um, this is our agenda for today to uh, to cover. Um, so we'll look a, uh, and learn a bit about Google Forms and some tips on how to create good forms. And we will then jump into Google Forms and start creating some forms and learning about how to collect responses and as well as some of the advanced features that are available with Google Forms. And then we'll wrap it up with some resources and any questions you may have. And we will try to squeeze in some uh, community updates there as well at the end for you guys to share what you guys have been working on. So let's get started with Google Forms. A little bit about Google Forms. It's a survey administration software that is included in the Google software suite. Uh, so in Google with Google Workspace uh, or uh, what was previously known as G Suite. Uh, and it's also available as part of the free Google offering. So if you have a free at Gmail account, you can also create your own Google Forms through there as well. It basically allows you to collect information from users through surveys and that collected information is automatically entered into a spreadsheet on Google Sheets so that you can then use that information uh, in other ways for whatever you need. Uh, some of the benefits are really that it is a, a great way to get answers fast, either from um, you know uh, your donors, your volunteers, uh, whoever you need to get information from. It's a great quick way to get that information online. And it's also mobile friendly and very responsive, so you're able to use it uh, with uh, any application. You can also customize it uh, with your own, obviously your own questions you can create, uh, and there's a whole bunch of different question types that we'll look at as well. And you can also add images and YouTube videos, or you can get fancy with uh, branching uh, your questions and using skip logic to kind of skip over questions if you need to with different streams. 
And finally, you can also um, share your responses and get them in a very neat and automated way through the forum so that you can get real-time responses uh, into information like charts, for example, or you can view it all in sheets as well. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, you can use Google Forms through your free at Gmail Google account or you can use it through a Google Workspace account. So the difference uh, with Google Workspace uh, is it's uh, usually a subscription service. However, Google for nonprofits gets you access to Google Workspace for free. So if that's what you're using, then you do have a few added benefits when you're using Google Forms through your free Google for Nonprofits workspace account. Um, there aren't that many differences, but I did want to point them out just so you're aware. One of the great benefits of having Google Workspace is that you can use, um, you can create templates for your own organization. So if it's a uh, form that you know may need to be tweaked every month perhaps, and updated, you may want to create a template for your organization so that it can be reused all the time. Uh, you can also duplicate duplicate existing forms if you need to in order to modify them slightly, but having the templates in one space is easier when you're working with multiple people because then you can all access the same template and not accidentally override that original version. Another uh, benefit or difference between using Google Workspace and a free Gmail account is that you can restrict the form to only be filled out by people within your organization. So if you're creating forms that are only internal, so you know perhaps you're doing something like a uh, maybe an expense report uh, type of thing that you're including that you're using Google Forms for, you can. Uh, ensure that the form is only accessed by somebody who is in your Google Workspace account. The other difference is if you're using Chromebooks as part of your organization, which is really only applicable to schools, which may not be the case for most nonprofits, but you can turn on a locked mode for Chromebooks um, so that the respondents can't open other tabs. So this would be most likely used if you're using it for tests or quizzes. Um, but that's those were the only differences really that are there between Google for nonprofits. Uh, yes, Eli, you're right. So if you do restrict it to your own organization, then you won't be able to share it with anyone publicly. <laughs> that is right. Um, so you have to, you do have to be careful and, and it would be a very specific use case, I think, in that case. Um, okay, so with surveys and forms, you really need to be clear as to what information you're collecting in order to make it truly effective. So some forms may need to have a lot of questions, but make sure you really need each of those questions. So you want to ask with every question that you're adding to your form or survey, you want to make sure that it really has value and that you know what you're going to do with the response. So sometimes, you know, you might ask, think to ask a whole whack of questions, but do you really need that information? Adding too many questions will, you know, discourage the person who's filling it out as well as, you know, probably not uh, have them not give you the correct answers that they want to give because they're just going to get tired of filling out a whole bunch of forms. So be very careful when you're creating your form so that you only ask what you really need. And the other thing is you really want to ask only one question at the t at a time. So you can, um, for example, uh, l let's say you need to collect somebody's name. Do you really need to ask it, uh, ask for first name and last name separately? Or do you just need to know somebody's name so that you know how to refer to to them as. Um, it, it just helps reduce the number of times that somebody needs to enter in information. So you may just want customer name as opposed to first and last name. And an another kind of example as to 
how to ask one question at a time and it's really sorry my dog's excited <laughs> um, if you really want to uh, ask one question at a time so if for example in with drop down responses or yes or no questions if you ask something like an open-ended question like did you find the presentation useful and entertaining that's really actually two questions it's it sounds like it might be one but you know for example me as a respondent I may have found that presentation very entertaining but I didn't find it useful at all but I won't be able to answer yes or no um, to that question because there's different answers to it so you want to be careful with how you phrase your question so that you are truly asking only one question so that you can just get that one response and with all of your questions you really want to be as direct as possible so that the person who's answering your question knows exactly what you're asking for so an example here is you know if you were to ask our our is our organization better than other charities uh, that's a really open and uh, vague question that's going to get you a whole bunch of different responses a, a better way to kind of narrow that down is to really think about uh, what kind of response you're really looking for and you might want to ask instead what do you think makes us better than our than competing charities maybe um, just to really be specific and direct as to what you're asking it helps give you helps ensure that the respondents giving you good responses okay so we'll move on to the next tip here you really want to keep your forms easy to read uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to use too many acronyms or any technical or industry jargon that might only be known to a specific uh, set of people um, so I know a lot of this happens in the IT world and I'm sure ev every industry has some acronyms that people take for granted but if you have new respondents and people who are uh, new to your organization or new to the industry they may not know what they stand for so you want to make sure you spell out any acronyms so that people actually know what it is you're asking for in case they don't know what it is or maybe they've forgotten um, or and <laughs> you don't want them to confuse it with a uh, different acronym as well right uh, another tip is to make sure you create a flow with your questions so if you start with easy questions it gives the respondent a uh, more more incentive I guess to keep going until they get to the harder questions but if you put those hard questions that really make them think at the beginning they're less likely to fill out information uh, you want to try not to use questions that are too difficult in the first place you want to make it easy for them to understand but having a nice flow to your form um, you know so starting with your basic questions you know what are your names what are what's your name your email um, you know any demographic data that you may want to collect keep those easy questions first and then flow into more thought-provoking questions as you uh, go go on another tip in order to keep it easy to to read is to use sections so that you don't have you know 100 questions on the first page of your form because it can be intimidating to somebody who's filling it out to see all those questions and then think oh I don't know if I really have time to do all this so using sections kind of breaks it down and uh, allows them to um, kind of uh, break their thoughts into uh, smaller chunks the same way it, you would with the form right um, and the other benefit with uh, sections is that you can also redirect respondents to different sections based on previous questions so for example if you're asking your volunteers you know what area would you like what municipality would you like to volunteer in and you have a list of cities and say you have Toronto and Brampton and, and Ottawa whatever cities you may have um, 
and you need to collect additional information only if they respond to with Toronto as an option. You can then direct anybody who responds to, with the answer Toronto to that question to a specific set of sub questions without needing everybody else to also go through those questions when it's not relevant to them at all. Uh, so having that form designed in a useful way and using sections in that way will create a nice flow so that your um, respondents will find it easy to fill out. Okay, another tip I have when creating forms is to think about the answers when you phrase the questions and we touched a bit on this earlier. Um, you want to keep the end in mind when you're creating your forms. So read the question and the possible answers that you've provided, especially if you're using multiple choice, um, or think about open-ended answers. So read it multiple times and try to think if there's different ways to interpret the question or to see if you're leading the respondent to answer the question in a certain way. So an example of that may be you know, if there's a question of, uh, you know, do you agree with half the population that winter is the worst season? That kind of question leads you, leads the respondent to want to agree with the majority or, you know, that winter is the worst, even though you're saying that the other half don't think it's the worst, it might lead them to agree. So a better way to phrase that question would be, to possibly word it as a multiple choice and say which season do you think is the worst and then list each season so that they would have to make the selection. So it removes some bias to the way you phrase the question. Um, and you can also have different response types. So you want to consider how you're going to use the information when you receive it to decide what kind of response types you want. So uh, when I'm talking about response types, I'm talking about the different types of fields that there may be. So you may use open text fields or you may use drop down fields or uh, multiple choice or you may be able to select multiple responses. So if you're, um, you know, if you ask something like, what is your favorite color and you leave the responses open text, you know, one person might spell orange one way, somebody might spell it with a capital, somebody might do lowercase, somebody might misspell it, somebody might say their favorite color is tangerine, not orange, which means you're going to get a whole bunch of different responses that if you need to do any sort of uh, data on, uh, like any charts or calculations or reporting on those responses, uh, you won't be able to do that without massaging and cleaning up all the data that came in. So a better way would be to either use a drop down or uh, uh, have check boxes where they can select their answers so that the data responses are uh, always similar. And validation can also help with the responses you get to make sure that you're getting the right kind of answers. So for example, if you were looking to um, submit a form for or have a volunteer submit a form and they needed to have a certification within a certain number of years uh, past, for example. Um, and you want the year to be four digits long and that the certification should be relevant within the past 10 years, for example, you can put the validation on the response that only allows the user to enter a number that is greater than, you know, 2011, for example. So that'll eliminate any responses where somebody may only enter the last two digits of the year because they're forced to enter the four. And then it helps you validate that text and or that number. And you can uh, use that for reporting as well. And there's a whole bunch of different types of validation as well. You can even validate the uh, that the text response is an email address, for example, um, and a, a whole bunch of different validations. But validation is really useful to make sure you get the information you want. Um, okay, so 
another very, very important part and having worked in IT for a long time um, and a uh, <laughs> very long time, uh, privacy is very, very important. Um, so in general, you want to make sure you're only collecting private information if you really, really, really need it. Um, and if you do, you really need to make sure you're uh, following all of the rules and regulations around the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada as well. And I have a link there at the bottom that you can uh, review to make sure that you're being compliant uh, with anything you need to be compliant with. Um, but basically, you know, for the most part, you, you know, so, some people uh, may want to collect a date of birth because they want to maybe send some, send their volunteers a birthday card or their donors a birthday card or re reminder uh, when their birthday comes around. You don't necessarily have to ask for their specific date of birth in that case. You can just ask them for their month of birth. That way you can, um, you know, send them a birthday card that month and uh, not have to uh, get their entire birth date. Okay. All right, another t uh, tip. Once you've designed your form and you've looked it over and you've uh, you know gone through all the tips that I, I recommended, uh, you really want to test with a pilot group if you can. So test with a few people um, um, if you have some you know volunteers or even just other uh, co-workers or staff members, um, anybody or anybody from that kind of group, you can. Uh, have them test the form and see what kind of responses you get out of them. So that'll help you to validate if you're capturing the right information or if you've missed anything. It also helps with getting a second set of eyes to do spell check <laughs> and uh, capture any errors that you might have found. Um, so that wraps up some of the tips and tricks I have for generally creating forms and hopefully you found that useful. If you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go. I'll try to keep an eye out. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer your questions at the end. Uh, so for now, we're going to go through creating uh, forms in Google Forms. I am not 100% sure if we'll have time to do a live demo, but um, everything I have on the slides here um, are screenshots from Google Forms, so we should uh, you should be able to uh, you know get enough information here that you need in order to uh, have a good understanding of Google Forms, and I will try to sneak some live demo in at the end if I can. All right, so to start. Uh, you need to create a new form. So if you are creating a new form uh, from Google Drive, you can click on Drive in your Google Drive folder and you can then go down to More if you need to to find Google Forms and select Google Forms. You can also select um, or create new forms by going to your Google Launchpad and selecting Google Forms from there as well. So you have two different options when you're creating a new form. You can use a template if you have one. So if you can see there, um, you see Toronto Area Chapter 1, it says Parent. Um, you can click on that side to get any of your organization's templates that you've saved. Or there's a whole bunch of templates that Google has made available under the General tab. So these are a few of the different ones that they have. If you need an idea of where to start with or how to lay something out, this is a great place to start. Once you create a new form, you'll have a, uh, a basic form with just the one question and it'll say Untitled Form and this is kind of where you start. And uh, one of the places where I like to start is to pick a theme. So you can choose an image for your header and it'll appear at the top header part of your form. Uh, and if you click on choose image, you'll see, I believe there's a few defaults available, but you can also upload your own if I'm not mistaken, um, which is handy for customizing it and making it more relevant to your organization. 
You can change your theme color, your background color, and your font, although the font selections they have are uh, not great. Um, I stick with the basic because it seems to be the most professional feeling one. Uh, the other fonts available are a little bit kiddish in my opinion, um, but they work. Uh, you can also change your colors from the top panel over here. That's where you can go to open your theme. And now we'll talk a little bit about the layout here. So uh, in the the uh, right section over here, this is where you can go to add different elements to your form. So you can add text headings, uh, you can add pictures, you can add a YouTube video, and the bottom one there with the two rectangular bars is your sections. So this is what you would use to break up your form so that you only show a few questions at a time on each page and you would scroll through each section if you uh, needed to um, break up your form a bit so what we were talking about before if um, you know if you wanted to split it out so that somebody who responded to Toronto uh, goes to a different section uh, this is where you would make that break between all the questions and I that's the one I will try to show you if we have time at the end when you are adding questions to your form um, you have a whole bunch of different types of fields that you can add to your form so your short answer field is for a short uh, line of text and your paragraph will allow you to add more text like a paragraph. <laughs> Multiple choice is useful when you want the user to select only one of many options and see all the options at the same time. Check boxes are useful when you want your uh, respondent to be able to select multiple responses at the same time. Uh, drop down field is very similar to the multiple choice in the way that you're going to get a response, but it just displays differently so you can only select one as well but uh, you only see one at a time unless you open the drop down field. File upload is also another option that you can add to your form so this might be handy if maybe you're using the form to um, collect uh, maybe you're uh, recruiting staff and you're using it as a recruitment intake form or a uh, onboarding form where you want the user to upload uh, maybe a policy statement they've signed or maybe you want somebody to upload their resume or cover letter uh, you can use that here as well or maybe you need them to upload a uh, profile picture uh, depending obviously what you're using your form, form for but they can uh, upload files uh, scales and grids are a way to um, capture a, kind of a, a range of data so I think we've all kind of seen the linear one where you know uh, you know on the far left side is something you don't agree with and the far right side is something you highly agree with and you can pick your answer based on a scale of information uh, so that's useful for ranking information and the multiple choice grid is similar to the linear scale but you can add multiple items at once uh, in one grid as opposed to having to repeat the linear scale each time and the checkbox grid is similar um, but obviously you can make multiple choices per line instead of just one where you which is uh, what you would have with the multiple choice. And the other two types are the date field and the time field. Um, somebody's asking here about the file upload. Does the user need to have a Google account? I've had that problem before and had to use a third party. And I believe you're correct. I believe you do need to have a Google account in order to upload a file. Um, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you're correct on that. Uh, so yes, you may, and, and I know the same is true with other, um, some other apps as well. I'm pretty sure Microsoft Forms uh, has the same issue, uh, or it could be an organizational setting. 
I can look into that and double check for you, but I am pretty sure that with Google, you do need to have a, um, a Google account in order to upload. Okay, uh, so those are the different questions that you can add to your form. Uh, oh, yes, sorry, I was just looking at my notes again. Um, <laughs> you can only allow, uh, it will only allow users with a Google account to fill out the form, so that is correct. <laughs> I did have that in my, my speaker notes that I wasn't looking at. Um, you also will not be able to, okay, so sorry, if you use the file upload option, uh, only users with a Google account can fill out the form. You also will not be able to embed the form. So if you were planning to embed the form on a um, on, on your website, for example, as opposed to using it through a link, you won't be able to embed it. And if you do use the file upload option and sharing via link, it will save the files to a folder on your Google Drive. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Form facade, okay, cool. All right, so let's move along here. Uh, oh, so sorry, that is the uh, plus button that you would click on to get to add these additional fields. So this is an example of working with the questions. So this is an example of a uh, multiple choice question. So you can rearrange the uh, questions by dragging and dropping them by clicking on this little uh, six dot grid and you can drag them up and down the page in order to reorder them. You can also duplicate a question that you've used before by clicking on the little copy button at the bottom and that's useful if you you know ha want to keep the same validations maybe or uh, a lot of the same responses but need to rephrase the, t the question um, that can be really handy. Uh, clicking on the trash icon obviously will move the question to uh, trash, so it'll remove it from your form. If you have already, um, if you're editing an existing form and you delete the question, it won't delete the responses from your backend spreadsheet if they've already been captured. So just be aware of that, that, th that you won't lose that past history. Uh, you'll have to go into the spreadsheet and manually remove it. You can also toggle the required um, option on or off. So the field can either be required, which means it's mandatory to be filled in in order for the person to complete the form and submit it, um, or you can turn it off. Uh, so w one thing to be aware of here is that if you are making a field required, and, but the person responding maybe has a different answer, or the question doesn't apply to them, then you need to really make sure that you're able to capture that response or all responses. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the user giving you dummy data. Um, so, you know, maybe this question on the screen isn't the best example of it, but uh, perhaps maybe they're not a customer at all in this case. Maybe they're a volunteer um, and this question doesn't apply to them if you force this question to be required they have no answer to select so they're going to pick one of these two and it's going to be wrong and it could skew with your data um, the addition so if you open the additional options in the uh, little corner there there's additional options that'll pop up uh, you'll be able, it will look different for every field, so it'll depend on what kind of field it is, but that's where you can add additional validation, um, and there's a few different options depending on the field. We won't be able to go into every specific one, but uh, that's where you would look. So once we have um, selected or created our form based on all those tips and tricks and rearranged our form the way we like it, we can start to collect responses. So the whole point in having a form is to be able to get that information in a clear and concise manner so that you can use it to accomplish whatever task you're trying to accomplish. So in order to share the form, you need to request that somebody fills them out. So there's a few different ways you can share your form. So you would typically start by clicking on the send button that's at the top right of the screen, and that'll give you a few different options for sending and sharing the form with others. 
Uh, so you have the option here to collect email addresses. So if you are going to collect email addresses, that will require a Google login to complete the form. So if you do need to capture someone's email address and you want to keep it open to non-Google users, assuming you don't need them to upload anything, uh, you can uh, include it, include the email address as a field on the form as a short text uh, field and there's validation on the short text field to ensure that they're entering a email address. So that would be the workaround for not collecting email addresses and forcing them to log in via Google. So the first option here is to send via email. So you can use this option here. You can enter in the user's email address that you want to send it to and you know you can add a subject and a message and you can actually include the form right in the email and you can hit send and it will go to them. So that's if you're sending one by one or you can uh, paste multiple uh, email addresses in there. If you move over to the next tab you can send via a link and you can click on shorten URL to make it a shorter easier link to copy and paste and then you can take this link and copy it and you can share it wherever you need to share it. So you can share it in an email to whoever needs to respond to it. You can share it online and anyone who clicks that link will come to your form and be able to fill it out. The final way to share or send your form is to, or not the final way, but another way to send the form is to embed it. Uh, so again, this won't work if uh, you're using the up, uh, if you're using file uploads, you won't be able to embed the form. Uh, but if you are not using that, you can copy this code and paste it into the HTML section of your website uh, to have it embedded right in your form. Um, it can be hit and miss depending on how how your site is set up. Uh, Another recommendation is to use the link and tie it to a picture uh, or a button on your form so that it opens in another page. I just find it's a better user experience usually uh, to go directly to the form rather than to work on it embedded. Uh, but every situation is different. So as long as it's not an incredibly long form, you should be okay to embed it. If you do have something that's more than, I'd say, you know, 10 or 15 questions, you might want to consider not embedding it and having them redirect to a link instead. Uh, the other option you have for sending is to share directly to Facebook or Twitter. So if you click these buttons, you'll be able to uh, share your form um, directly to Facebook and Twitter. Uh, a little box will pop up and allow you to uh, uh, post uh, directly to Facebook and Twitter. Uh, next is your responses. So these, um, at the very top of the page, you'll see questions and responses. So if you click on the responses tab, this is where you'll see uh, all of your responses that come in. And let me just keep moving here. Oh, sorry. I think I meant to uh, do this in a live demo so we'll see if we can get there but um, in the top right of that screen there you'll see a little uh, spreadsheet icon the little green spreadsheet icon if you click on that that will open the Google sheet that's directly related to this form and you'll see all of your responses in a spreadsheet form so there'll be a column for each question and all the responses will uh, show up in the form under there as well. And if you decide you need to turn off the form so you don't want to accept any more responses, you can use that toggle button to turn it on or off under accepting responses. And on the responses page, there are three different sections and I'm not sure if I'll be able to get to them, uh, but there is a summary page that will kind of show you some graphs and grids for each of the uh, uh, questions that you've uh, that have been asked and you can also look at it from a question to question basis 
or you can look at all the individual responses. So you'll be able to scroll through all the individual forms that some somebody has uh, sent in. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the more advanced features of Google Forms. So you can add collaborators from the menu found at the top right corner of the page. So it's similar to sharing. Uh, you can do it from the send button as well. There's an option there. Uh, so you can add editors so that they can come and collaborate on the form with you. Or um, again, under the three little dots, if you scroll about halfway down, you'll see add collaborators. You can get there as well. Oh, there it is. And again, from the send button, you can um, go to your settings okay sorry these are um, yes so these are your settings uh, and this is where you can go to set uh, settings that are specific to this form that you're working on so they won't apply to all forms that you've ever created it's just specifically for this form so the first tab is the general tab whoops uh, and this is where you, you can also select here whether or not you're going to collect email addresses. The same rule applies. You can only collect um, uh, email addresses if you're only if, if you're logged into a Gmail account. If you are doing that, you can also make sure to limit to one response. That also requires that you have you, the respondent is logged in with a Gmail account. And you can also choose if they want to edit after they submit the form so that they can go and change their information if, if needed, uh, or you can leave it blank. I think for the most case, most people uh, tend to leave this blank. Uh, you don't want people to edit their uh, information after they submit it. Uh, but you may want them to see a summary of the charts and text responses that have come in. Uh, so if it's something a bit more collaborative, you may want them to be able to see the responses that have come in. Presentation, this gives you a few different options and this is where you can uh, show a link to submit another response. Uh, and this is where you can show the confirmation message. So this, is, this will display on the screen after they've submitted the form. So if you wanted to uh, give them more information for what they, uh, for anything related to the form or who they can contact if they have questions or where to follow up or direct them to your website, you can put all that information here in the confirmation message. Um, and also with the, uh, you can show the progress bar, uh, which is up there at the first checkbox. So that will display how much, how many more pages or questions they have to complete in order to submit the form um, and that's optional or you can shuffle the question order which uh, is useful if you're doing something like surveys and you don't want people to be biased based on uh, the way they're filling out their responses um, so keep in mind when you use that though if you structured your form to kind of have the easier questions at the beginning like I recommended uh, then you may not want to shuffle them, but it is useful if you're doing something like a quiz, which we'll get to here. Um, so if, if you want to turn your form into a quiz, and this is probably used more in the education uh, section, or maybe you're using it as a quiz to evaluate, you know, if your volunteers understood a training session, for example, uh, you could create it as a quiz. So you can then assign um, if you mark this as a quiz and you go back to your form the questions will have additional fields to them so in the back end when you're designing your form they'll have additional uh, settings where you can kind of where you can define what the grades are for each question and what the value values are so that it will be able to score it for you uh, quizzes are a little bit more detailed, so I'm not going to go into it too much, seeing as we have eight minutes left. Uh, th this would be the answer key, or an example for the answer key. So if uh, you go, if you have set it up as a quiz and you go to responses, you'll see uh, you'll see it a little differently. So you'll be able to see what everyone's average uh, score was and the medium and the range as well. Oops, sorry. 
Um, so I was going to try to do a demo, but I don't think I have enough time. So I'm going to wrap this up and see if I have any questions. And if there's something you want me to show, I can uh, definitely open it up and show you. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, the power of using something like Google Forms is really what you can do with it after the fact. Uh, it's great that you, it's, it's a great and easy way to collect data and information uh, at the outset for whatever you need, but being able to take that information and use it somewhere else is really what makes it powerful. So Zapier is a automation tool that can really expand uh, your use of Google Forms. So depending what information you're collecting or, or where you need it to go, uh, these are just some of the examples uh, that Zapier's put together that are kind of uh, default zaps uh, that you can use to automate. Um, so for example, if somebody submits a uh, Google form, you can create a Trello card if you use Trello or a Santa if you use a Santa. Uh, you can put responses into a Slack channel if you use Slack. You can update your MailChimp subscribers. You can send an, an email. So by default, Google Forms doesn't send an automated email response. It just displays that message on the screen that I showed you. But if you wanted an email to go to that respondent automatically, you can set up a Zapier and have it send an email through your Gmail account um, for any form submissions. And you can take information that they submitted in the form and include it in the email as well. So if you wanted to send their responses back to them to validate what they've done. Um, or you can even use it as a two or three steps app if you wanted to take their submission, you know, do some calculations on it or, or do something to it and then send it back. Um, there's options for that as well. You can even create Google Calendar events. So if they're, you know, maybe submitting a request for a, a meeting date or an interview date or something, um, or a due date, maybe, uh, you can use that as well. Um, and again, I mentioned to Santa. So those are some great uh, tips. Um, last thing is resources. So if you do need any help with Google Forms, uh, the one funny thing with Google Forms is the help button is in the very, very bottom right corner. Um, whereas I think most of the other Google apps, it's a little more prominent up at the top. Uh, but if you need Google help within Google Forms, it's down there at the bottom. I also offer one-on-one -on -one training and consulting. If you do need to uh, get a bit deeper or you need any help setting up forms or doing any automations, you can reach out to me as well. I'm happy to help if I can. And I mentioned earlier, our next event is our virtual onboarding program using free tools. Uh, and I think that's all I have. And I've, I've left four minutes for you, <laughs> you guys to ask any questions if you have any, or if you wanted to see anything specific, I can pull up Google Forms and show you. Um, you can either come off mute or drop me a message in the chat and I can uh, try to help you. Hello, Sandra. Um, this is Boran from Orchestras Canada. Thank you so Hi. much for an amazing uh, presentation. Really, really useful. Okay. Uh, my question is that I noticed that in our organization, um, we tend to use Google Forms for more like day to day surveys. Like we just had a conference and we just want to do a quick survey with, with the people who attended. Right. But for some reason, like for more elaborate surveys, we tend to use um, SurveyMonkey. And okay. yeah. I, I don't know why that is, but I'm just asking you, like, is there an advantage of using SurveyMonkey? Is it, does it have more options? Like, uh, I'm, I'm wondering- I think, it does have, I think it does have a lot more options and analytics um, built in. There, um, I haven't used SurveyMonkey in a while because for most, for the most part, I can do most of what I need through um, Google Forms. Uh, I, I know the, I think the power of Google, of SurveyMonkey was um, all, all the analytics, like it is definitely more powerful and there's different ways to use it. Um, I, I don't know specifically, without knowing 
what their use cases are. I'm not sure why they'd use that more than Google Forms. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, I understand. I mean, just uh, yeah, with the um, fact that the analytics are, uh, if they're more elaborate, then that would make sense to use on a bigger survey. Yeah, especially with bigger surveys, I think. Um, and I, I think there might have been other options. It, it might have been able to get around that issue with uh, file uploads uh, and mm. not needing to be a Google, a Gmail user in order to do some of the respondents because sometimes it's limited that way. So I think SurveyMonkey is a little more flexible with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, Sarah's asking if I've used Google Forms for integration with Salesforce database. Um, I haven't specifically, but um, I'm pretty sure that Zapier is able to do that because I know they integrate with Salesforce. I'd be surprised if they couldn't integrate the two together. Um, so it it should be possible. I haven't done it specifically though. I, I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> There's also, if you're not, um, if that doesn't work, there. I'm sure you could also use Airtable, and I'm not sure if you guys um, were at our last event with uh, Matt Bourne, who did uh, a session on Airtable. I'm sure there's a way you can use Google Forms and Salesforce within Airtable to kind of connect them and to connect that data. Uh, that would possibly be another option as well. Any other questions? Yeah, Air, it's called Airtable. If you look back on our events, um, on our uh, on our chapter page on uh, events.techsoup.org, uh, and look for the Airtable event that just happened, uh, I want to say two weeks ago, uh, you'll get more information about Airtable as well. It was a great session for anybody. Um, that missed it. Excellent. Well, we're at one o'clock. So if you do have any other questions or feedback or anything you want to chat about, um, you can reach me at Sandra at allaboutsystems.ca uh, and or through the event page. I think you can get uh, me there as well. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, you too.